Hello, it's Ruby, and today I am going to be sharing with you a Victorian scullery maid morning routine. So this video is following the upper class Victorian morning routine, which I followed a couple of weeks ago. In that video, I did mention how huge the wealth divide was in the Victorian era, and you will really see this when you compare this morning routine to the last one. My main intention in making this video is for it to be educational and for it to teach you something about what life was like for Victorian scullery maids so because it seemed wrong to upload the last one and then not make this one. The Victorian period is fascinating and I find it very interesting and so I hope that you walk away from this video having learned something. I am so so conscious though of this video romanticising the period and particularly romanticising the experiences of a scullery maid. Being a scullery maid was hard work they would work the hardest in the house, sometimes as young as nine or ten, and they would also work for very little, so the salary was about five to nine pounds a year, which is hardly anything. Actually, in Mrs. Beaton's 1861, The Book of Household Management, the scullery maid was the only servant in the house that the writer expresses some degree of empathy towards. She says that she is perhaps the only one of her class deserving of commiseration. Her life is a solitary one, and in some places her work is never done. So really just bear that in mind whilst watching this. I'm not intending to glamorise the experience of a scullery maid and um, yeah, I just hope that this video can teach you something. A Victorian scullery maid would usually wake up at about 6am but it could be as early as 5 in the morning. A scullery maid would usually sleep in the attic, usually sharing the room with the kitchen maid and it was also not uncommon for the scullery maid and the kitchen maid to even share a single bed. If you lived in the textiles district, you might have had a rag rug for when you got out of bed, but if not, you would have been stepping onto very, very cold ground. So the room would have been very, very cold when they woke up. Windows were always left open to prevent the spread of disease because as Dr. Henry Chavez said, it was like inhaling poison to sleep in a room where the window was closed. And so even in the dead of winter, in the drafty attic, the windows would be left open. She would have washed using a wash basin and jug and the water would likely have been left overnight in the bedroom. Whilst upper and middle class people could have used warm water, she would have had to use cold water and would not have been able to access soap as well. Over the course of the period, soap did become more accessible and much cheaper with um, soap brands like Pears. At the beginning of the century, it was, um, it was too expensive for normal people to buy. Cold water was actually thought to be a good choice overall though because it was thought to improve circulation. Scullery maids would usually be issued with two aprons so that one could be clean and they could wash them in between. She would comb out her hair. A simple scented parting and a high bun was um, deemed quite fashionable and then over the course of the century the fashionable height of the bun changed a lot so sometimes it was a low bun, sometimes a high bun, sometimes a middle bun. So then it's time to go downstairs and get started with chores for the day. This would usually be like 5.30 to 6.30. Lighting the fires was the very first point of call. This is so that the house would warm up a little before the family woke up. Obviously it would take a long time for it actually to heat up the rooms, but it would make it a lot easier for the family when they did wake up. And um, also so that there would be hot water for the wash basins and tea from the family. A scullery maid would clean the ash from the fire and probably get really dirty in the process. And then she would also light the fires.
She was also responsible for cleaning the kitchen in the morning, so she'd wipe down all the surfaces, she would mop. This was often before many of the servants were downstairs. As I said, the scullery maid was hugely overworked and often started work earlier than the other servants in the house. So a scullery maid was an underservant, which means that she would have served the servants. So for example, she would be responsible for serving the servants tea. There was separate crockery for servants and then the family. century before green tea had been the most popular, but black tea was by far the most popular tea in the Victorian period. She would also wash up from the servants' breakfast. So there were two separate sinks. One was for the china and glassware, which this was a wood sink, and uh, the footman under the butler would wash up this stuff. And then the scullery maid would wash up in an enamel sink. And this would be for pots and pans, and also the servants' uh, cutlery and crockery. Hot water would be boiled on the stove and then poured into the sink to wash up. So it was only after doing all of this that she would finally be able to make her own breakfast. So she would be like hugely hungry by this point, think this is like nearly nine o'clock and she hasn't eaten and she's done all of that manual labor. And also, as I said, she's likely very young. So a standard breakfast for a scullery maid was a hunk of bread, tea and cocoa. I was very interested to hear that cocoa was like a very standard part of a Victorian diet. It was thought to have medicinal powers and in the late 18th century you would have been able to find it in chemists. This was usually unsweetened and and um, yeah cocoa became much more accessible during the Victorian period, it was seen as a staple. But quite concerningly the cheap cocoa which was sold might have included red lead or brick dust to, pad to pad it out and make it cheaper to produce which is really really disturbing. So then after breakfast, it would be time for morning prayer, where everybody in the house, all of the servants and uh, the family would uh, gather together for morning prayers and Bible study. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and, and I hope that it taught you something new about the Victorian period. I really enjoy learning about the daily experiences of different people from the past and specifically the Victorian period because so much happened in the 19th century. As I said, it's really important not to over romanticize the period and forget the huge systematic issues which existed in Victorian British life. Let me know if you want to see more videos related to the Victorians. I really really enjoy this format of video and um, enjoy teaching you about the Victorians and um, like doing the research and preparation for these videos. It's just so much fun so uh, let me know if there's anything in particular that you'd like to see. I do have some ideas but it would be great to know what you would like to see. Anyway thank you for watching and I hope that you have a productive week. Thank you.